the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Carl, um, we are the uh, probably the best kept secret in Santa Barbara County, a very small organization. Two years ago, we were me. <laughs> and now there are over 30. I would like to ask everyone who works for LCO to just stand up. <laughs> so there's a that's a fraction of the gang. Uh, there's actually 60 people around the world. What we're doing is building a unique observatory. It will consist of approximately 50 to 70 telescopes spread all over the world of various sizes. And the idea is to make them available both to, uh, for our own staff, to scientists from around the world, and most particularly to children. And we already have two two-meter telescopes, which are quite, quite large. I mean, they're much bigger than my wingspan. Uh, they weigh about 28 tons. And uh, those are used most school nights by school children in the UK and in Europe. And that's particularly because the telescopes are in Hawaii and Australia. And it's dark there while it's light in Europe. And we ex expect to expand this network so that school children here can come, to, for instance, to here or in their classrooms and observe with telescopes. So that's what we're about, and we're having a good deal of fun, and we sponsor this, this lecture series. And the idea is to bring a world-renowned astronomer who's done something extraordinarily important to this community once a year, and to have uh, both that astronomer work with the our people and the UCSB astronomers for a week, and then to give a public lecture here. And the subtitle on this lecture tonight is uh, Golita Boy Does Good. <laughs> so I'll, I'll now introduce Dr. Uh, Crystal Martin from UCSB uh, Physics Department, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, now on to the main event, dark energy and the runaway universe. Um, Alex Filipenko is a professor at UC Berkeley, where his research on exploding stars has won numerous awards and played a major role in the startling discovery that space is not only stretching, but space is stretching faster and faster as time progresses. Alex is not only very well known for his research, but is just a phenomenal lecturer. He's won numerous teaching awards at Berkeley, and just last year was named the National Professor of the Year. You may have listened to some of his uh, astronomy video lectures, a 96 lecture series that's put out by the teaching company. And thanks to the generosity of Las Cumbres Observatory, our graduate students at UCSB got to hear several technical lectures from him this week and participate in discussions. So tonight, um, we're hoping to share with you some of the excitement and stimulation that we get from, from just doing science. And I'd like you to extend a warm welcome to a Santa Barbara native, Alex Filipenko.
Well, thank you very much, Crystal, Kurt, Wayne, and everyone else. It's really been wonderful coming back here. This is kind of like a homecoming. I grew up in Santa Barbara, went to Fairview Elementary School. That doesn't exist, I guess, as such anymore. Goleta Valley Junior High and Dos Pueblos High School. And then finally, you see Santa Barbara. And it's been amazing, actually, to see some of my teachers from all these schools progress progressively back. I haven't met anyone from Goleta Valley. Anyone here who taught me in Goleta Valley Junior High? <laughs> Yes? We'll, we'll chat afterwards, okay? With the bright lights, I can't exactly tell who you are, but that's just an excuse. I, I met Jim Stahl and a few others here, and unfortunately, you know, senility must be creeping in or something, because I recognized the face but couldn't quite say the name. Um, that doesn't mean you didn't make a profound impression on me. You, you did, you know? <laughs> um, but my, but my roots in physics and astrophysics were really seeded here at uh, UCSB, where I had some really wonderful professors, and many of them are here today. And um, as part of, in particular, the College of Creative Studies, I was taught to defend my arguments and stand up on my feet and, you know, solve difficult problems and, and things like that. And I found that that's been extremely useful throughout my career. And that's something you actually don't get at many uh, universities, even small private colleges. So. It's been great fun uh, visiting this week. My voice is now hoarse because I'm coming down with a cold. I've been talking to people nonstop, but it's been worth it. It's been really, really great coming back. Um, I want to particularly acknowledge Wayne Rosing and the Las Cumbres Observatory for sponsoring this lecture series and for choosing me to be the second annual lecturer. Wayne is a remarkable guy. If you, if you don't know his history, you can Google, quite literally, Wayne Rosing and uh, find out all about him. But he started this, this amazing network of something like 60 telescopes that will be placed throughout the world to monitor objects that need to be monitored sort of day and night. But any, at any given place, you can only do it during the day. So the idea is to have these telescopes throughout the world where somewhere it will be nighttime and, um, and you'll be able to monitor these objects at night. If I said at, during the, did I say during the day a minute ago? I didn't mean that. Listen to what I meant to say, not uh, to what I actually said. That's what professors are taught to do, right? Um, anyway, so that's really great. And if some sort of a crazy object goes off in the middle of the night somewhere, you can redirect one of these telescopes to that object and uh, get useful data on it. So he's a real visionary. And his scientific director, who's also here, is, is Tim Brown. So I'd like to uh, really extend my thanks to them for establishing this network. Uh, here's one of the telescopes that's uh, being produced by the by LCOGT Inc. Net, dot, net, dot, inc, whatever. And uh, I toured their facilities today and was mightily impressed by what they've accomplished, accomplished, accomplished in just a year and a half. So it's really, really fantastic. Um, so anyway, this talk tonight will be about cosmology. Now, cosmology is that subset of astronomy that deals with the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole. We're interested in some of the grandest questions. When did the universe begin? You know, is it infinitely old? Uh, we now think, think it began something like 14 billion years ago. Uh, how will it end? What will its fate be far, far in the future? You know, these are national magazine front cover stories. Now, these magazines want to educate the public, but of course, they also want to make money. And they make a lot of their money from newsstand sales, not just from subscriptions. And they will not choose a cover story that they don't think will sell. But astronomy sells, and in particular, cosmology sells. These are, as I say, the grandest questions. Is the universe infinite? Does it wrap around itself? Uh, what is its overall structure and shape? These are the kinds of questions we ask. It's the kinds of questions that people have wondered about ever since their brains became sufficiently advanced to to conceptualize and, you know, such questions and then to think about how such questions might be answered. We are also interested in cosmology in galaxies, how they formed, how they evolved with time. 
Here's a galaxy much like our own Milky Way galaxy. It consists of hundreds of billions of stars gravitationally bound into this nice whirlpool shape in this particular case. How did such things form and how do they evolve with time? You might say, well, there's our Milky Way galaxy and maybe you've heard a few of others like Andromeda and the whirlpool, but you might not think that they're all over the place, in fact. Galaxies are the fundamental building blocks of the universe, just as stars are the fundamental building blocks of galaxies. And one of my favorite photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope is this Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This, in fact, is just part of it. This is a small but representative sample of the sky. If you hold up a small pebble or a large grain of sand at arm's length and imagine what fraction of the sky that grain of sand covers, that's the fraction of the sky subtended by this photograph. Yet in this photograph, there's something like one or two thousand galaxies like our Milky Way. We can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. I could spend my whole hour doing that, but uh, it wouldn't be terribly interesting. Nevertheless, you can see that astronomers have really cushy jobs. We get paid for sitting around counting galaxies. So it's really great. Yeah, it's a, that's, I think, the best kept secret. Anyway, you look at this thing and you say, all right, there are one or two thousand galaxies. How many galaxies are there spread throughout the sky? we estimate that there's something like 50 to 100 billion galaxies accessible to great telescopes like the Hubble. And that's just in the parts of the universe that we can see. We now have good reasons to think that the universe is far, far larger than just those parts that we can see. And everywhere we look, it is filled with galaxies. How did they form? How do they evolve with time? Fundamental questions indeed. Now, before I move on, let me point out that among the general public, present company excluded, there's often a misperception. There's a confusion between cosmology, the study of the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole, and cosmetology, the study of <laughs> hairdos and facials. <laughs> they both have the same root, cosmos, all that there is, or to make order of, but they have bifurcated as have <laughs> astrology and astronomy. And in fact, they're even spelled differently. Cosmetology is the same as cosmology, but with an extra ET, like the extraterrestrial. I'm not sure of the cosmic significance of that, but write them down, and cosmetology only differs from cosmology by an ET. Well, of course, they are fundamentally different now, but to illustrate an example of this confusion, let me show you a, a copy of an ad that a colleague placed in my mailbox a few months ago. Make cosmology your career. <laughs> Training and supervision in hairstyling, blow drying, permanent waves, coloring and frosting. You laugh, but these are all very important topics, okay? Scalp treatments, body and skin care, style cuts, basic cuts. For further information and <laughs> interviews, call that number. Now, classes started, la you know, in March but maybe you can join late or maybe there's a summer session or a fall session and you know if you want to get to the cutting edge of cosmology as I and my colleagues have done you need to take a course like this sorry about the very bad pun I couldn't I couldn't uh, resist well these guys obviously need a lesson not on the not just on the differences between cosmology and cosmetology but in spelling and proofreading because in addition to Futher here, you notice hair slime. You see that <laughs> hair slime? <Well. laughs> and coloring. Well, that's okay. That's the British spelling, and my own thesis advisor at Caltech was British, so uh, I'll allow that. But anyway, okay, pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, these guys don't even know what it is they're teaching. Okay. <laughs> So a central figure in this field was Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named. And he made a number of startling discoveries, the most important of which, for the purposes of my talk this evening, is that, as was mentioned earlier, the universe is, is expanding. It's not just that the galaxies are zipping through some pre-existing space, getting farther and farther from one, one another. Rather, it's that space itself, the fabric of space itself, is expanding, stretching with time getting bigger and bigger. And there's ways we can tell the difference between space itself stretching and galaxies flying like bullets through a pre-existing space. And it really is that the galaxies and, you know, are spreading apart because space is, is growing. 
And he came to this conclusion by passing the light of galaxies through a prism like this and measuring the rainbow or the spectrum of light from each galaxy. And the spectrum tells us many, many important things about galaxies, like the chemical composition of the stars of which they are made and the typical temperatures of those stars and things like that. But for my purposes here, what's important about the spectrum is that it can tell you whether an object is moving toward you or away from you and also how quickly. And this is somewhat analogous to the audible Doppler effect. When a siren of a known pitch is going away from you, it sounds low. And when it's coming toward you, it sounds high. So if it zooms past you, it goes like that. You've all heard this effect. Now, if you hear a siren that's going ee-yaw, 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 it doesn't mean that the driver is drunk and going around in circles. It just means that the siren itself doesn't have a constant pitch. But you can still hear it go from a high-pitched ee to a low-pitched ee Okay, And in a similar way, light gets moved over to redder or longer wavelengths if the object is moving away from you, and it gets moved, or moved to shorter wavelengths or bluer wavelengths if it is moving toward you, if the object is moving toward you. So there's a red shift and a, and a blue shift. And what Hubble found is that basically just about every galaxy is red shifted, but more interestingly, the greater is the distance, the current distance of the galaxy, the greater is the red shift. So here are some galaxies that are about 60 million light years away, and they're moving away from us at something like 1,200 kilometers per second. Okay, that's pretty fast. That's breaking the local speed limit. And here are some more distant, fainter looking galaxies that are farther away, okay, and they're moving away from us even faster. So at a given time right now, all the galaxies basically are moving away from us except for those that are so close that, that they're gravitationally bound to ours, but that's just a technicality. So they're all moving away, and those that are farther away from us right now are moving away faster. So if you look from our perspective at a diagram, it looks something like this. Here are all these galaxies, and they're all moving away from us. Here we are, and the more distant ones are moving faster than the nearby ones. That alone is not evidence that the universe's expansion is accelerating. It just means that the more distant ones have more space between us and them than the more nearby ones, as I will illustrate in a minute. But before I do so, there's something rather strange about this diagram. Let me pause. What's strange about it? Yeah, we're at the center. There we are. You know, is that likely? Do, do the, is it something we said, or do they not like us, or, or do we smell? Um, or maybe, maybe the, all these galaxies are lactose intolerant. Get it? Mil Milky Way, lactose intolerant, yeah. An 11-year-old student told me that joke. He came up with it during a public talk that I gave some years ago, and I asked him for permission to use that joke, and he gave it to me. Um, when I, give, when I give similar versions of this talk at my home institution, Berkeley or Cal, I say, are we from Stanford? You know, <laughs> big rivals. With due apologies for the probably many Stanford alumni that are here. It's a very, very fine institution, of course, just not quite as fine as Cal. So, uh, <laughs> okay, well, in fact, um, we don't think we're in any special place in the universe. We think that we live in a uniformly expanding space, and no matter which galaxy you happen to be in, you would see the others moving away with a speed that is proportional to their current distance. So here's a very simple one-dimensional universe. I'm told I shouldn't move around too much or else I'll go out of the camera field of view, so I'll just stay right here. But suppose I have this one-dimensional universe where the galaxies are these ping-pong balls, and they don't expand, by the way, because they're gravitationally held um, so strongly that they don't experience the expansion of space. But the space between them expands. So if you put yourself on this yellow ball right here, you see all the other ones moving away. And the more distant ones move away faster than the nearby ones because there's more rubber between us and the more distant ones than there is between us and the nearby ones. And in a given amount of time then, all of that rubber stretches by a uniform amount per centimeter, and so this more distant one moves farther away. But that conclusion did not at all depend on which ping pong ball I chose to be my home, right? It could have been the yellow one, but it could have been any of these other ones next door, right? Forgetting about the end of this rubber band here, either the universe is infinite or it wraps around itself, so don't worry about the edge. There is no edge, but nor is there any unique center, at least not in any of the dimensions to which we have physical access. If you don't like a one-dimensional universe, take this one here, an expanding loaf of raisin bread. 
where all the dough has yeast uniformly spread through it. And again, for, forget about the edges. It's either an infinite universe or it wraps around itself over a very, very large radius. And um, you let this thing bake for an hour, let's say, and let's say it doubles in size in an hour. You can see that all the galaxies moved away from this one, but oops, but so so is the case for all the other galaxies. From all the other galaxies, you can see the same perspective. All the galaxies move away, and the more dough there is to begin with, the more it stretches, and so it looks like these more distant galaxies are moving away faster. So none of them is at any unique center. Okay. We live in a uniformly expanding universe with no unique center. Well, you might ask, how quickly is the universe expanding? And with telescopes like the Hubble and Keck and other telescopes, astronomers have now measured the speed of expansion pretty darn well, depending on with whom you speak at something like plus or minus 5%, something like that. But the story doesn't end there. In fact, we expect the universe's expansion rate to change with time. And that's because the universe is filled with stuff and stuff pulls on other stuff, as Mr. Newton told us many hundreds of years ago. Here you have this apple. You can't give a talk about gravity without using the proverbial Newtonian apple. So here I toss it in the air, and the mutual gravitational attraction between the Earth and the apple causes the apple to slow down in its upward trajectory. In fact, eventually it stops and comes crashing back down. That's because of the gravity between the apple and the Earth. So too, the galaxies are pulling on one another and should be slowing down the expansion of the universe. Now, if there are enough galaxies per unit volume, then the force of all these galaxies on each other should be sufficient to halt the expansion someday and then cause the universe to recollapse on itself. And that's analogous to an apple thrown at a speed less than the escape speed from the Earth. It comes up and then it comes crashing back down. So if you will, this could be the Big Bang, and then the big crunch, big bang, big crunch. Or you could say big bang, gnab, gib, which is big bang backwards, okay? Big bang, <laughs> gnab, gib. So if there's a lot of stuff in the universe, there will someday be a gnab, gib, where the universe becomes hot and compressed again, and all the galaxies and stars get destroyed. But had I eaten my Wheaties this morning, and if there were no ceiling here, or air resistance and things like that, I could, in principle, heave this apple at a speed greater than the Earth's escape speed, and it would never come crashing back down. Equivalently, if the mass of the Earth were much smaller, I could toss this apple, and it would never come crashing back down. So in a similar way, if the density of the universe, if the number of galaxies per unit volume is sufficiently small, then, in fact, the universe could expand forever having a fate very different from that of the Big Crunch. Instead of a hot, compressed state, it would eternally expand, becoming cold, dim, dark, dilute. I told you that one of the central questions of cosmology is what the fate of the universe is, and so we would like to know this fate. Well, okay, how do we do that? We have to look back into the history of the expansion. And if the thing has not been slowing down very much, then it's likely that it'll keep on expanding forever. In fact, it's not just a probabilistic argument. You can set up equations and things. But if you measure the speed of a, as a function of time, and it's been slowing down a lot, then in fact, it'll probably reach some maximum extent and then reverse in on itself. So we would love to know what it's going to do, and we can figure it out by looking back into the past history of the universe. Now, you might say, that's impossible. How can you look back into the past? We live right now, after all. But does anyone have a clue as to how maybe you could look back into the past? Anyone want to venture a guess? Physicists here who already know are, are excluded from this contest. Yes? By looking at the stars, because they're always having to be light, you look, you're look back at the time. Yeah, he's got the right idea. What's your name? Phil. Phil. Phil's got the right idea you look at progressively more distant objects and you see them as they were farther back in time. And that's because light doesn't travel at an in infinite speed, it travels at a finite speed. It's very fast. It's about a foot per billionth of a second, a foot per nanosecond. So you might think that's infinitely fast, but it's not. I'm seeing Phil as he was perhaps 20 billionths of a second ago. He might not even exist anymore. Oh, he does. You know, I, good for me, I had a larger audience. Even better for him, he's still on this good earth. You see the sun as it was a little over eight minutes ago, because it takes eight minutes or so for the light to travel 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles. You see even the nearest stars in the sky 
as they were typically some tens of years ago, because some, they're some tens or hundreds of light years away. But if you look at galaxies that are, say, a billion light years away, and maybe that one's four billion light years, and this one here might be nine billion light years, and that little smudge there might be 11 billion light years away, then basically you're seeing them as they were, one, four, nine, 11 billion years ago, and encrypted in that light is information about the expansion rate of the universe as it was one, four, nine, 11 billion years ago. So you can look back in time and trace the expansion history of the universe. Now to do that, you need accurate distances. So how do you get distances of galaxies? Well, the way astronomers normally do that, at least for nearby galaxies, is that they find a star in that nearby galaxy. Let's say that one. Let's call it Wayne. Uh, and Wayne here has detailed properties just like those of a star that you've studied in our own galaxy and whose distance you know. For example, Betelgeuse here. Okay, we happen to know just how powerful intrinsically Betelgeuse is. And you might think all the stars are the same, but they're not. They're, they're different. You know, there are different classes of stars. And if you see that that star there is just like Betelgeuse, and you know the true power of Betelgeuse, then by comparing that star's apparent brightness with the known luminosity or power of Betelgeuse, you can figure out the distance of that star and hence of the galaxy in which it's located. This is essentially you're using the inverse square law of light. A good example is that if you look at an oncoming car at night, one way you judge its distance is by looking at how bright the headlights appear to be. You've calibrated how bright the headlights are of a car of known distance nearby, and you make this almost instinctive, almost intuitive comparison. You judge the distance of the car. If you're not very good at doing this, you shouldn't be driving at night, okay? <laughs> Maybe you're good at looking at the angular separation between the two headlights. We also use that, it turns out, to judge the distance of a car. But the idea is there, okay? So you might say, okay, that's fine for a nearby galaxy, but these galaxies here are so distant that, in fact, the individual stars merge together. And this galaxy might consist of 100 billion stars, but you can't see the individual stars. And in this galaxy there, it's even worse. They've all merged together, and in fact, you can't see the individual stars. So you might say this technique won't work for distant galaxies, and you don't really know if that galaxy is 4 billion light years away, or 3.5, or 4.2. You might say that you don't know the distance accurately enough to do this cosmological test, to figure out how long ago you're looking and to you know, retrace the expansion history of the universe. But in fact, there is one type of star that can be seen at distances of billions of light years. Anyone know what kind of star that is? A supernova. What's a supernova? It's an exploding star. That's right, an exploding star. I mean, here's one. Our sun will not do this, fortunately. It will die relatively quietly. We'll still get burned. You know, you think global warming is bad now. Wait a couple of hundred million years and, you know, not that I'm saying we shouldn't do anything about it now, but wait a couple of hundred million years and it'll be a lot worse, okay? So here's a star that uh, exploded. And some of these explosions can become several billion times the power of our sun. So if our sun were to do this, you'd need sunblock or supernova block of several billion in order to protect yourself. Uh, fortunately, we don't need to worry about the sun doing this, and so you won't see much supernova block, you know, two billion on sale in stores. Um, some of these things are tremendously powerful. And in fact, here you can see a star that brightens, and at its peak, it was about as bright as, as the central billion or so stars in the nucleus of this galaxy. And just last week, some of you may have read about work that my team at Berkeley did in identifying and studying the most powerful exploding star ever seen. This is a NASA illustration. This isn't, we don't have such a detailed photograph of it. But uh, this thing was as bright at its peak as the typical brightest supernovae that we've known. I'm sorry, it was 10 times as bright as the typical brightest supernovae. And its light lasted, that is, remained bright, a factor of 10 longer. So 10 times 10 is 100. This thing emitted about 100 times as much energy as typical luminous 
supernovae. And here's a NASA animation of what we think happened. Before the star exploded, it had this cosmic burp, an outburst where it ejected two lobes of material, and then the star exploded for real and produced a tremendously powerful explosion. This was Supernova 2006-GY. For those who are interested, you can Google it and find out more about it. So that was a tremendously powerful explosion, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what caused it, but we think that there's a new mechanism that caused this particular type of explosion that was predicted 40 years ago, and this might be the first observed example of it. Now, the supernovae that I'm interested in for the purposes of this talk are not those really weirdo kinds that I just mentioned, but rather a supernova called a Type 1A, where a weird kind of a star called a white dwarf, similar to what our sun will become in six or seven billion years, gathers material from a companion star and reaches an unstable mass at which it explodes. And most of these things explode at about the same mass in the same way, and so they reach the same true brilliance, the same power, and you can use them, in a sense, as standard headlights or standard candles. These white dwarfs are really weird stuff. They're made out of a type of matter known as degenerate matter, not because it's morally reprehensible or anything like that, but rather that's just the term that quantum physicists give to this type of matter that's incredibly compressed. And our sun will become one of these things later on, as I say, but it won't blow up because, as far as we can tell, our sun does not have a companion star from which to steal matter. So we want to find these type 1a supernovae in galaxies of known distance, in galaxies where measurements of stars like Wayne have already told us the distance, normal stars. So we already know the distance of this galaxy. We measure the peak brightness of the supernova, and then that combination of known distance and measured peak brightness gives us the true power or oomph or luminosity of the supernova. We need to calibrate the headlight. And they might be different. There might be variations among them. So you want to do this with a bunch of supernovae to make sure you've calibrated them correctly. The more, the merrier. But these supernovae are rare. A type 1a supernova might go off in a galaxy such as this once per century. Okay, and it's really more like once per couple of centuries, let's say. But let's say once per century, or maybe twice per century, a different kind of supernova will go off. So I could be you know, a really cruel advisor and have each of my students staring through the eyepiece of a telescope each and every night. You know, because I'm not going to do this work, right? So have the students do it. Well, you know, they'd be students for 50 or 100 years, and meanwhile they'd be chained to the computer during the day doing calculations for me. There are some crimes, of course, that are so egregious that even a tenured professor can get fired, and that would be one such crime. Uh, but you could look at thousands of galaxies, and since these are statistically independent events, if there's one supernova per century per galaxy, if you look at thousands of galaxies, there's going to be several tens of supernovae per year. You can do that calculation. So I could have the students looking around through the telescope at a bunch of different supernovae, and once they found 10 or 20 or something, they would graduate, and that would just take them a couple of years. Nevertheless, this would be considered cruel and unusual punishment as well, and so I'd probably be fired. Fortunately, there's an easier way. There's an easier way. You don't have to look through the eyepiece. All you need to do is take photographs of random galaxies and look for arrows, and where there are arrows, <laughs> there are exploding stars. You see it? happened once, twice, three times, four, five times. By rigorous methods of mathematical induction, I conclude that it must happen every time, okay? Well, okay, if it were that easy, you know, we wouldn't give degrees for this kind of thing. Uh, what we really do, of course, is we program robotic telescopes, and Wayne Rosing's LCOGT network telescopes will be robotic, to take pictures of galaxies um, over the course of many years, but they take a picture of a given galaxy perhaps once a week, and they compare the new picture with the old picture, and usually there's nothing new in the new picture, but sometimes there is something new, and that gets flagged as a supernova candidate. And my team has been operating one of these robotic telescopes successfully since around 1997. It's called the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope, partially funded by the Sylvia and Jim Katzman Foundation. And I'm extremely happy to report that Wayne Rosing's Tabasco Foundation is also now a supporter of this telescope. And indeed, 
uh, LCOGT uh, is using this to some extent as a model of how their telescopes, their network, their global network of telescopes will operate in the future. So we have this thing at Lick Observatory. It's about a two-hour drive from the Berkeley campus, one hour east of San Jose. And my associate, Wei Dong Li, who's brilliant, has programmed this thing to automatically, night after night, look at lots and lots of galaxies. We look at maybe 1,200 per night, over seven or 8,000 per week. And then we start repeating the exposures. And he's written all the software to do that and to make the comparisons of the new pictures with the old pictures. And sometimes it's really quite obvious in the new picture, there's this dot marked with an arrow. Well, OK, the arrow gets put in by the software. But clearly, in the old picture, that thing wasn't there. This is a star exploding in this galaxy 100 million light years away. It is about as bright as a star in our own Milky Way galaxy about 1,000 light years away. 100 million, 1,000, you can do the inverse square law if you wish to. Uh, this is roughly a factor of 10 billion, so I, I exaggerated a little bit. But 4 billion is perhaps a more typical factor, but I wanted to use round numbers. So here, perhaps, the case is quite clear. Usually, it's not so clear, and there are supernova candidates that are flagged that end up being you know, poorly subtracted stars, like the star might not subtract well when you subtract one image from another, or there might be asteroids flying through the field of view, or there might be charged particles that hit our detector that masquerade as a star. So I use the superior eye-brain combination of undergraduate students to filter through the 50 to 100 supernova candidates that are found each night out of these 12 or 1400 images and they determine which of these objects is most likely, most deserving of follow-up, most likely to be a supernova, and those are the ones that we follow. So my undergraduates get hands-on experience quite early. This is a rather old picture, 2005. It's a bit cut off there. That's okay. I should, I should update this picture. But they're all in grad school now, and in fact, he was a high school student at Berkeley High at the time that he was doing the research with my group, and now he's an undergraduate at Harvard. So uh, that's pretty good. So they get excited about the supernova discoveries, and they get their names associated with the supernovae in the discovery telegrams. And it's a really great educational tool. And indeed, with LCOGT, school kids all over the world will be able to, in principle, look at pictures like this and for themselves identify exploding stars. So it should be a great thrill for them. I'm extremely happy to say that our group beats all others in the world at finding nearby exploding stars. Indeed, there are six or seven competing groups in the world we find about half of all the nearby exploding stars, and those other six groups combined find the other half. So I'm really quite pleased with this record. Our first one was in 1997 when we were just getting started. You might say that was a supernova of questionable integrity, given its name, Supernova 1997BS. But in fact, they are named in order of discovery, A, B, C through Z, A, 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 B, A, C through A, Z, B, A, and so on. So you can figure out what number that was that year. We then really got rolling, setting a bunch of world records, breaking our own world record many times. We found the first supernova of the new millennium, regardless of your definition of the new millennium. Not that that's astrophysically important, but it was kind of cool anyway. <laughs> now, we could find more of them. We've stabilized in the mid-80s here, mid to low 80s. We could find more by looking at each galaxy less frequently and simply observing more galaxies. Um, and we could find more if we were to devote some of our telescope, more of our telescope time to the search rather than to the scientific follow-up of the supernovae that we find. But we want to really do some science with them. So we actually spend only 70 or 80 percent of our time searching, and we spend the rest of the time doing these follow-up observations. And we search each galaxy roughly once a week in order to find the things when they are young. And that's to maximize the science that we gain from these discoveries. It's not all just about finding more and more of them. I should say that having found about 750 of them or so uh, in the last 10 years, we can now determine a good rate for different kinds of supernovae. There are different ways that stars can explode in different kinds of galaxies. And I have a fantastic student, Jesse Lehman, who is doing that for his doctoral work right now. He's a quadriplegic. He had a skiing accident as a senior in high school. But he decided to move on and 
have a positive outlook on life, and he graduated with honors from the University of Maryland and then came to Berkeley for his graduate studies. He can't move much of anything except for his head, but he has a great brain, and he can speak to his computer and program that computer and deal with very large databases. So I can't send him observing to the telescope, nor can I have him doing pencil and paper theory, but he can milk giant data sets, and he's been doing a great job, and you'll hear more from him in the future. So we're going to be publishing a great paper on supernova rates pretty soon. Okay, well, through these studies and those done by my colleagues in at Harvard and Texas and, and other institutions, we now have a pretty good understanding of nearby type 1a supernovae. We'd like to have a better understanding, so these studies are continuing. But at least we have a good enough understanding that we can now go off and look for distant ones and do some real cosmology with them. So we've calibrated the headlight. So now here's part two of the talk. There's been two teams that have historically been looking for high redshift or distant type 1a supernovae in order to trace the expansion history of the universe. The one that I've been most closely associated with is the high Z or high redshift supernova search team led by Brian Schmidt of the Australian National University. The other one is the supernova cosmology project led by Saul Perlmutter of the Lawrence Berkeley lab and he's also now a professor of physics at Berkeley. I was part of this team for a while but just different cultures led me to switch teams. They come, came from a culture of high energy particle physicists and I came from the culture of astronomers and we just do science in different ways. Neither one is better than the other, they're just different and I was more comfortable doing science the way I used to do it. So um, it's been a generally healthy and spirited competition. Each team wanted to be first, each team wanted to be best. If one team was taking into account some sort of a subtle effect and the other team was not, that other team would look bad. So it was a good thing. Competition can be a good thing. And contrary to popular belief, our team leaders were not always at each other's throats. This was a picture taken at Aspen where we had some uh, discussions on supernovae, but generally it's been a, a spirited thing, Brian and Saul. Now what we do is we use bigger telescopes. This one happens to be in Chile at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory and it's four meters in diameter. And we take deep, wide angle pictures of the sky. By deep, I mean we look at faint galaxies, not just the bright galaxies. So in a picture like this, you might see hundreds of galaxies, even a thousand galaxies. Indeed, there's very few stars in our own galaxy in this, in this picture. Almost every blob you see is another galaxy. And if you take a bunch of pictures across the sky over the course of a few nights, if you do the math, you find that you might be monitoring something like 100,000 galaxies. So if you repeat those photographs three weeks later, the odds are that among those 100,000 galaxies, several dozen, in fact, will have blown up. And we can find them, again, by subtracting one image from another, Here's just a small subset of one image taken on the 7th of April and the 28th of April. You subtract this one from that one, you get a bunch of noise. Every measurement process has noise associated with it. But here, cleverly placed in the middle of the square, is something that looks like it might be significant, a supernova candidate. It might be something else. It might be an asteroid flying through our field of view or something like that. Indeed, there have been so-called Kuiper Belt objects, Pluto-like things, that fly through our field of view and we, we throw them away. They're garbage. But one person's garbage is another person's gold, of course. You know all the hullabaloo about the Kuiper Belt objects and how we don't consider Pluto to be a true planet anymore. Anyway, we're looking for supernovae and here in the Hubble image, you can see a good image of that supernova candidate. But it remains a candidate until a spectrum is taken. And in fact, the spectrum will tell us whether it's a supernova and whether it's a supernova of the right variety. But these objects are so faint that we need the world's largest telescopes, the two Keck 10-meter telescopes, jointly owned and operated by Caltech and the University of California. We need those to take spectra. And here is the former director of the Keck telescopes, Fred Chaffee, sitting in the hole in the middle of this 10-meter diameter network of 36 hexagonal segments, like a honeycomb. Usually, he's not there while we're doing the observations. That was just a PR shot. His small pupils do not add significantly to the light gathering power of this telescope. Okay. Well, when we get the spectrum and it turns out to be a type 1a supernova uh, of the normal variety and all that kind of stuff, well then, in fact, 
I'm a very happy camper, and you can see then the real reason why we build observatories in Hawaii. I live in Northern California where the water, the ocean water is too cold for swimming, and I like the beach just as much as anyone else, so it's nice to go to Hawaii. But all joking aside, Hawaii is a wonderful place for these telescopes because of the stability of the atmosphere, the darkness of the sky, um, and other factors. So it's a really great place. Well, we find these supernovae, we take spectra, and then we follow up on the ones that are most promising. And here we're coming to the punchline. Okay? Here are three faint distant galaxies in which there are three supernovae, dutifully marked with arrows. And these supernovae are faint, really faint. And you might say, well, big deal. You were looking for faint distant supernovae in faint distant galaxies. Why are you so surprised? Well, these guys are fainter than they have any reasonable right to be in any reasonable universe. Suppose the universe were one second old, one second from the Big Bang, okay? And I toss this apple. After one second, the apple reaches some distance above my hands, right? But it's been slowing down. If the Earth's gravity were weaker, it wouldn't slow down as much and it would go higher in one second. Now, I can't make Earth's gravity weaker, but I can do the next best thing. I can throw the apple faster. It's not quite the same thing, but it you know, at least gives the same result. So in one second, the apple gets farther if the gravity is weaker. Now suppose the Earth were not present. The apple would have no reason to slow down in the absence of all other bodies in the solar system and in the universe. Just forget about them all. The apple would have no reason to slow down. And so in one second, it would reach an even greater distance, right? Well, what we're saying is, is that the apple, the supernovae, are at a greater distance than they could have reached even if they had not been slowing down at all. So they're at, a, they're at a greater distance than even with a constant speed. So in the absence of other subtle effects, which we did have to consider, you know, maybe the things look too dim because there's dust or gas in the way blocking some of the light, like fog on a, you know, like headlights on a foggy night. You'll overestimate the distance of the car if you don't take into account the fog, right? But in the absence of all these other effects, which we did rule out one by one, the obvious conclusion then is that if the thing looks fainter than expected, then its distance is what? Farther away. And so if even a constant speed wouldn't suffice, what must have happened to the thing? It must have accelerated. So it's like you attach a rocket to this thing and it goes zoom like that. Oh man, you know, wrong answer we thought. We were trying to measure the rate of slowing down of the universe. And instead, we find that it's speeding up. That's really, really weird. You know, um, it, it suggests some sort of a cosmic anti-gravity. Astronomers see a cosmic anti-gravity force at work, you know, accelerating the expansion of space. And we use this term anti-gravity hesitantly because people ask us, well, can we attach this stuff, whatever it is, to our cars and levitate over LA traffic jams or Santa Barbara or whatever, you know. No, we, we can't attach this stuff to our cars. As far as we can tell, this stuff cannot be harnessed. It is a property of space itself. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, and it's only anti-gravity in a sense. It's not like there are two masses here and they kind of feel each other and they go away from each other. No, it's rather a property of space that causes space to expand faster and faster with time. Our team leader said, Brian, Brian Schmidt said, my own reaction is somewhere between amazement and horror. Amazement because this is not the answer we expected. Horror because we still weren't ap absolutely sure that we're right. But we had done many checks and cross checks. A number of people on our team independently measured the data and came to the same conclusions. And we felt that we should announce this result. And we also knew that the other team is, was on to something. We didn't know what, what they were on to, but we figured they probably might have found the same effect, so we really should announce it. So in fact, I was privileged for our team to announce this at a meeting in Los Angeles in late February 1998. And it was really fantastic. But on our team, the first person to realize what the data were trying to tell us was my postdoc at the time, Adam Reese. He's now a professor at Johns Hopkins University. And the end of 1997 was perhaps, and the beginning of 98, was the most exciting time in my career. Because every once in a while, he'd come to me and he'd say, you know, you know, here, here's what the measurements are showing. 
And I'd say, you know, Adam, you know, what did they teach you at Harvard? He had been a grad student at Harvard. Didn't they teach you to measure the brightnesses of stars correctly? Or so I was thinking. I'm not sure I insulted him in this way. But, you know, I was worried about the measurements, as were other team members like Bob Kirshner, who's been spending his sabbatical at, at Santa Barbara at the Kavli Institute. But gradually we realized that the measurements had been done correctly, and Adam is now very, very famous, and correctly so. Here he is in, in Time magazine. By the end of 1998, the editors of Science Magazine proclaimed this to be the single most important discovery of science, in science during the entire year, in all fields of science. And both, both groups were credited with this. And indeed, had there not been two teams that reported this result, I don't think that uh, anyone would have believed it. Because, you know, they would have said, well, maybe you made some programming error and 2 plus 2 equals 5. That would have been a real embarrassment. That doesn't, Im that doesn't give you more funding in science, you know. Uh, or maybe there was something subtle, like we haven't taken into account this fog correctly or, or the properties of the fog are different or something weird is going on. Well, that wouldn't have been such an embarrassment. We would learn something about the universe that way. And that's the way science progresses. We never prove anything. We can only get a better and better working model of the universe and reject competing hypotheses, okay? So, you know, we, we were horrified that we might have made a mistake, but we had done many cross-checks, and then, you know, two teams had the same result, and we still didn't believe it near the end of 1998, but the editors told us that's okay. Many people have had a chance to check your results. No one has found any clear errors in the measurements or in the interpretation. Either the universe is accelerating for some unknown reason, or you've found something interesting about the universe that, you know, will be figured out in the next few years, but it will be nothing to be ashamed of. And so we were very grateful that they um, honored us in this way. Now, the caricature of Einstein is surprised here. Um, you might think that it's because he's blowing universes out of his pipe. But in fact, that's where universes come from. They come from the pipes of famous theoretical physicists. Um, that's another lecture. Maybe some other day I can come back. Seriously, though, this is one universe which is speeding up in its expansion, and that's hard to show in one still picture. So he's surprised about that. He's doubly surprised because he has this sheaf of papers where there's an equation. Lambda equals 8 pi times g, Newton's constant of gravity, times the density of the vacuum. Now, you might say, what in the world is this guy from Berserkly telling us the density of the vacuum? You were hopefully taught on your mother's knee that the vacuum is sheer emptiness, nothing. Nothing goes on there. It's got zero mass per unit volume or energy per unit volume. So what does he mean by this crazy hypothesis of a non-zero density? Well, shortly after de the development of the general theory of relativity, Einstein introduced a mathematical fudge factor which he called the cosmological constant, lambda, because he realized that in his general relativistic universe, as in the case of the Newtonian universe, things should attract each other. And even though the true nature of galaxies was not yet known at the time, the spirit of what I'm about to say still holds. Einstein figured that the universe should be collapsing in on itself because everything should be mutually, gravitationally attracting everything else. And since the sky wasn't falling, and the astronomers at Mount Wilson Observatory said that the universe seems to be static, Einstein included in his equations this fudge factor, which does not make the equations mathematically wrong. Indeed, one could say it generalizes the solutions. However, there were several problems. This thing made the equations less aesthetically pleasing, less mathematically beautiful, and physicists are drawn by aesthetics to some degree. Moreover, this thing suggested that the empty space is not empty after all. It has some sort of an energy and of a repulsive variety. And finally, this repulsive stuff had to have exactly the same magnitude or sign as the attractive gravity so that uh, acting in the direction opposite of gravity, it would exactly balance it. So here I'm holding this apple. My upward pull on it exactly matches the force of gravity pulling it down, so it's static. If one of the two were to dominate, the apple would not be static, okay? So he had to make this thing arbitrarily tuned, finely tuned, to match effectively the force of gravity. And there seemed to be no real reason that the stuff, even if it were to exist, would have this rather strange property. 
So he did not like the cosmological constant. And in fact, 12 years later, when Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe isn't static after all, but rather is expanding, the whole physical and philosophical motivation for such a weird energy um, disappeared. And Einstein basically um, said, to heck with the cosmological constant. He renounced it. He was sad that he had ever introduced it, because had he not done so, he would have predicted that the universe is likely to be in some sort of a dynamic state, not a static state. And there were some other theoretical physicists who did make that prediction. So here Einstein is sad that he ever introduced the cosmological constant. He never liked it, even though it isn't mathematically wrong. Okay, He renounced it. What we have done 70 or 80 years later is we've said, no, the idea, rather than being his biggest blunder, he anecdotally said that this was the biggest blunder of his career, rather than being the biggest blunder, the idea of a non-zero energy of the vacuum that somehow it causes some sort of repulsion may, it have, may have been in some ways his greatest triumph. And his blunder was in giving this thing exactly the same magnitude or size as the attractive force of gravity, giving you this very unlikely and in fact mathematically or physically unstable solution of a static universe. Um, it was this fine-tuning that was the blunder, but the idea may have been his, uh, his greatest triumph because we've resurrected it. And what we're saying is that though in this room gravity dominates, and in this solar system, and in our galaxy, and in our cluster of galaxies, gravity dominates, on scales of billion light years or more, this up arrow dominates over the down arrow, and so over the largest distances, the universe is in fact accelerating, spreading out faster and faster with time. Now, I don't know what Einstein's reaction would be if he were alive right now to hear it, to hear what we've discovered, but maybe it would be <laughs> something like this, okay? So, uh, anyway. Well, the conclusion that we drew in 1998 was based on supernovae that were only about four or five billion light years away. So what we could say is that in the last four or five billion years, the universe has been accelerating in its expansion. But a reasonable question to ask is, what was the universe doing in the first 9 billion years of its roughly 14 billion year life? If this stuff, whatever it is, is a constant property of space, then there's a very natural prediction. You would expect that at early times, the universe should have been slowing down in its expansion. And the reason is pretty simple. Long ago, the galaxies were closer together, so their gravitational attraction for one another was stronger. Even Newton would have agreed with that. And the repulsion was relatively weak because there wasn't much space between the galaxies. Okay? So if this stuff has a certain amount for, for every little volume of space, if the total amount of space between the galaxies is small, then the repulsion, the total repulsion, will be small. So plotting, in a sense, the strength of gravity versus time, the strength of gravity was going down because the galaxies were spreading apart. The cumulative effect of this repulsion was growing stronger with time as the galaxies spread apart and the volume of space became bigger and bigger. And eventually, then, the two crossed and the universe started accelerating. But while gravity was stronger than the anti-gravity, if you will, the universe should have been slowing down with time. Okay? So that's a clear prediction. Well, we went off with the Hubble Space Telescope and found very distant type 1a supernovae. Here's some of them. They are six, seven, eight, nine billion light years away. And lo and behold, the measurements suggest that back then, six, seven, eight, nine billion years ago, the universe was slowing down in its expansion. And it's only in the last four or five billion years that globally this stuff has taken over and started accelerating the expansion of the universe. So the universe went from deceleration to acceleration. That's a change in the deceleration. Obviously, you're slowing down, then you're speeding up. Such a change, mathematically, is known as a jerk. So in a sense, we measured the cosmos to have gone through a jerk. And the headlines that came out were the following, a cosmic jerk that reversed the universe. And here's my former postdoc, Adam Reese. Now, 
you know how it is with large newspapers like the LA Times or the New York Times. You rarely read the articles in their entirety. You look at the headlines and you look at the pictures, and if it looks especially interesting, maybe you read the entire article. So I start getting all these phone calls. Hey, who's this jerk you work with who <laughs> reversed the expansion of the universe? Well, it says that reversed, not who reversed. And, but, but Adam's mother was not very pleased by this juxtaposition. It's also not the best picture of Adam. But anyway, he forgives me for showing it. After all, it was in the New York Times. And, you know, any publicity in the New York Times is good publicity, right? So, okay, well, that's kind of cool. Well, then you might ask, what is this stuff? that we've found. Is it the visible matter in the universe that makes up the galaxies? No, because all visible that matter that we know of gravitationally attracts other matter. What about dark matter? How many of you have heard of dark matter? Yeah, a lot of people have heard of dark matter. Dark matter exists, you know, in abundance in clusters of galaxies like this. In fact, it's nine times as massive as the visible matter. And we know it's there because if it weren't there, the clusters of galaxies would be gravitationally unbound. They would be zipping past each other and would not stay together. And one of my heroes, Fritz Zwicky uh, of Caltech, he died in 1974-75, he came to this conclusion that there's dark matter in the universe in the early 1930s, but he was nearly uniformly ignored. Um, it's too bad. He was a brilliant guy. He made predictions about supernovae and stuff, but he was largely ignored because his colleagues at Caltech didn't like him. That's because he didn't think very highly of them. He was arrogant, he was abrasive, he was brilliant, but he was arrogant and abrasive, and in fact, legend has it, that he referred to his Caltech colleagues as spherical bastards, because you know, they're bastards any way you look at them. Well, uh, <laughs> this is... This is not a good way to make friends, okay? If you go around calling your friends spherical bastards, I don't think you're going to get very many dinner invitations. So, uh, but, but he did come up with dark matter. But anyway, dark matter pulls. It doesn't push. So it's not whatever this stuff is. This stuff is something new. And for want of a better term, astronomers now call it dark energy. And you'll hear about dark energy. It's a gr regrettable term, in my opinion, because, um, you know, the most famous equation in all of physics is what? E equals mc squared. Anyone on the street knows E equals mc squared. They might not know what it means. Chances are they really don't know what it means, but they will have heard the thing. And so is dark energy in some way the same thing as dark matter? No, no, no. Banish the thought. They are completely different things. Dark energy is some sort of a weird thing with a positive energy, but uh, a negative pressure. And the negative pressure is what, in a sense, stretches space. And I don't claim to understand that. Don Maralf and Jim Hartle and other relativists at, relativists at UCSB can explain to you if you wish to know. But th this negative pressure is what does this to the universe. And so we call it, we call it dark energy. And this stuff is not a minor component of the universe. 73% of the energy plus mass content of the universe is this dark energy. And you know what? We don't know what it is. I would say we haven't a clue, except that that doesn't quite tell the whole story. There are hundreds of theories, but uh, we really don't know which one is, is correct. One idea it is, is that it's the quantum fluctuations in the very vacuum of space itself. We've known for decades that space isn't empty. In fact, it's teeming with activity, and we can tell that it is because it ever so subtly affects the energy levels of the hydrogen atom and other atoms, and those effects have been measured. But it had been always assumed that overall, the positive energy fluctuations effectively cancel negative energy fluctuations so they're negative energy ones, to give you an energy of the vacuum that's precisely zero. And this assumption had been made by theoretical physicists not because they had a good mechanism for such a cancellation, but rather because if you don't assume such a magical cancellation, the natural amount of this dark energy that you predict is so many orders of magnitude bigger than it could possibly be that you know, we, we wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be around right now if it were that big. So physicists simply said, for reasons yet to be figured out, there is an exact cancellation of the positive and negative energy fluctuations. Well, if the positive ones slightly outnumber the negative ones for a net positive energy, 
Remarkably enough, it has the desired property of stretching space, of having a rather large negative pressure. But that's just one idea. It's the simplest idea, and the data right now are most consistent with that idea, but theoretical physicists really don't like that idea, and they're considering many other ideas. And you will read about dark energy, and the teams studying supernovae are now trying to quantify in more detail the expansion history of the universe in order to set observational constraints on what the dark energy might be. That's what we're trying to do in the next 10 years. But there's a lot of it, and we don't know what it is. There's also a lot of dark matter, and we don't know what this is in general. We think it's some sort of an elementary particle left over from the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, a kind of a particle unlike a proton or a neutron. The best candidates are the so-called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. But not a single one has ever been detected in a laboratory. You know, that may or may not be a problem, depending on with whom you speak. The people who are doing the experiments say that's not yet a problem. But of course, they want to continue to get funded. And this is, this is very good research. I don't mean to belittle it, seriously. Unless we check all these possibilities, we won't know. But it is disconcerting to me, at least, that no particles of the WIMP variety have yet been found. The atoms of which we consist constitute only 4% of the contents of the universe. The remaining 96% is basically of unknown physical properties or origin. That's kind of weird. That's not true in this room, okay, but in the vastness of space, most of which is mostly empty, it's actually filled with this stuff, okay? Here in this room, we're dominated by these guys. But only about a tenth of the 4%, that is 0.4%, consists of atoms that you can actually see, atoms that glow or reflect light, like stars or nebulae. So not to diminish our importance, but... We are the debris of the universe, the afterthought of creation, okay? And that's, again, to say that you're, it's not that you're not important. You are to yourself, your family, your loved ones. But I want to emphasize that we are not made of the dominant stuff of the universe. The dominant stuff is the dark matter, and we don't know what it is, and especially the dark energy, and we really don't know what it is. So there's a lot to be done by the young students and postdocs and those of you who are still in... Uh, in primary and, 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 and secondary school. So my license plate is, let's see if you can figure it out, dark in RG, dark energy, and the accelerating universe. My wife, Noelle, came up with that. She likes little word games like this. So dark energy and the accelerating universe. OK, so, so, uh, so you have this stuff, dark energy, and you might then ask, what will be the fate of the universe? Let's get back to the question I originally posed. Well, if the dark energy remains repulsive forever, then it's quite clear that the universe will expand forever. Not just because it doesn't have enough matter to ever bring itself back, but more importantly because it's dominated by the stuff that's making it expand faster and faster and faster with time. But uh, since we don't know what the dark energy is, it's actually quite conceivable that its sign will change in the future and become gravitationally attractive. Indeed, there's a historical precedent to this. We think that all of the stuff of which we are made was once a dark energy-like component that existed when the universe was a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a second old. And that component inflated the universe from something almost arbitrarily small into something far, far larger than what we can see. Indeed, this inflation may have made the universe 40 orders of magnitude larger or more than the parts that we can see. And this is a reasonable theory. This is not the ramblings of a crackpot, okay? So indeed, the analogy I like to give is that the ratio of all that there is, the diameter of all that there is, to the diameter of what we can see, 14 billion light years in, in all directions, may be at least as large as the ratio of the diameter of all that we can see to the diameter of a proton. Now, the proton is about yay big, and I exaggerate quite a bit. So our observed universe, according to this theory, may be a proton in all that there is. Okay, and it's filled with these galaxies. And so we think that a similar sort of dark energy may have inflated the universe into this gigantic, gigantic thing. Okay? Um, and now we see a modern-day example of it. 
And the theorists who had come up with this inflation theory, they were told early on that, well, this looks nice, but the problem is we've never seen any stuff that has these properties. Well, maybe now we have seen stuff of this kind, okay? And so, in a sense, it's leading to a resurgence in interest in these kinds of, of theories. The dark energy is important, not just because we don't understand it, but because most physicists would agree that to understand it, we will require a unification of the two great pillars of modern physics. General relativity on the one hand that deals beautifully well with the universe on the largest scales and quantum physics which deals beautifully with the phenomena on atomic and subatomic and molecular scales. They work beautifully in their respective domains. But when you try to bring them together, they're at war. They're at war with one another. They're mutually inconsistent. And it is thought that this is some sort of a a phenomenon that can be only understood through some quantum theory of gravity, be it string theory or some other competing theory. So there's great excitement about this dark energy because it may lead to an observational test that would lead to the elimination of at least some categories of these theories. Any theory that categorically denies the possibility that the universe could be filled with some sort of stuff like this can be eliminated as being wrong, and that's the spirit of science. So how will the universe end? Well, if the stuff remains attractive, uh, repulsive, it'll, it'll expand forever easily. But going back to my analogy, I forgot to say that the stuff that originally inflated the universe eventually turned into matter and antimatter and photons, and the matter and antimatter eventually annihilated, leaving a few little protons and stuff sitting around, and we are the result of that whole process. We used to be the dark energy that inflated the universe. But eventually that dark energy became normal, attractive matter. So it could be that this stuff will do the same thing, in which case the universe will recollapse. But if it remains gravitationally repulsive, then the universe will expand forever, faster and faster and faster. And I encourage you afterwards, after Q&A, to look through some of the telescopes at galaxies and clusters of galaxies, because if you want to see them with your very own eyes, you've got to do this soon, in the next few tens of billions of years, because beyond that time, the clusters of galaxies will have been whisked away to distances which make them too faint to see. Well, to close, Robert Frost apparently knew of these two possible fates for the universe. He may not know about, about anti-gravity, but he knew that it might recollapse into a fiery, dense, big crunch, in a sense an ending in fire, dense and hot and compressed, or eternal expansion, ending up cold and dark and dilute, in a sense an ending in ice. Because he had this famous poem, Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. So you see, Robert Frost would prefer this kind of a universe, an ending in fire. But if he had to perish twice, eternal expansion and an ending in ice would be okay. And that's perhaps appropriate, given his name, Robert Frost. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. I know a lot of you are, are interested in this, and this is really fantastic stuff. You know, Crystal, I think, mentioned my video lecture series with the teaching company. It covers cosmology and planets and all this sort of stuff um, in 96 half-hour lectures. It was just re-released in a second edition. I think it's on sale right now. They're giving it away. Go to Teaching Company or Teachco.com and you can get a lot more of this stuff. But I'll be very happy to uh, answer questions. I see a bunch of hands raised. Yeah, you can line up, I guess, uh, but I'll take one while you're lining up, and I'll be sure to repeat the question so everyone hears it. Go ahead there in the back. Yeah, the question is, does it make me uncomfortable that dark energy has gone from heresy to dogma in a decade, actually nine short years? You know, I go to talks and they start out with assuming the standard model of a dark energy plus dark matter dominated universe. Um, 
I, uh, I mean, it's, it, it sort of makes me uncomfortable, but the point is, is that there are now a lot of independent methods, several independent methods that lead to the same conclusion. If it were only based on type 1a supernovae, I would remain very nervous because it could be there, there, there's something weird going on with a supernovae. Maybe they used to be intrinsically dimmer and they look too dim because, you know, not because they're farther away or whatever. But there's now a number of different techniques that lead to the same conclusion. And some of those techniques are completely independent of supernovae. Moreover, try as we might, we can't find anything wrong with the supernovae. Um, and, and it's the nature of science where if you have independent methods that give the same result, your confidence in things grows and grows and grows. And indeed, it's now to the point where if you look at the large-scale structure of the universe, the clusters and superclusters of galaxies and things like that, and you ask, where did they come from? Well, we can see the echoes of the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation, and we can see tiny variations in the density of the matter back when the universe was not even 400,000 years old. And you take those initial density fluctuations and you run them through huge computer models, and we have fantastic computers now, and you watch them grow, and you model that growth with and without dark energy, and in fact, the observations better match the computer models if you include the dark energy. You know, that, that's one of the forms of evidence, okay? And there's a number of them now. And that's why I think it has gone to this acceptance. Does that mean we should forget, you know, about looking for possible things that have gone wrong? No. We should keep our eye out for that. We should be vigilant for that. Vigil vigilant for that. <laughs> so, um, but we are now addressing what are the properties of the dark energy. And your proposal, you say, okay, I'm going to try to figure out what the properties are, set observational constraints on it. Hopefully, in, in those sorts of studies, if the whole concept is wrong, we'll figure it out. But you can't get funding anymore if you just say, well, I want to test for the presence of dark energy because people will say, we really do think it's there. Why don't you test for what its properties might be? And in the process, if it's really not there, hopefully that will become obvious. So the nature of the question has changed. Yes? Or, I, or should I, are, are there people lined up, or should I just choose people? Uh, I'll, I'll go, pardon? You may, you may want to get in the line up here. So line up here? Okay. You can, well, or whatever, but it might be hard for people to leave their chairs. So go ahead for now. Okay. Hopefully it was understandable. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That what is outside that to it, right. And it faster, so right. Yeah. So here, here, the, the basically what's being said, and this is very perceptive. In fact, our bubble, this expanding balloon. Here, I've got just a two-dimensional example um, of a universe. It's you know, suppose you can go forwards and backwards and left and right, but not in and out. So this is an expanding universe. I won't expand it too much, otherwise I'll get a little bang, you know. But anyway. It's expanding into some third dimension, which is, in fact, the way I've defined it, not part of this hypothetical universe. And the question that's being asked is that, suppose there's some grander hyperspace where there are all sorts of little bubble universes floating around in a four-dimensional bulk, as we call it. And indeed, string theory and its various variations are, are seriously considering that our three spatial dimensions and one, lar and one time dimension, at least the big ones, we think there might be little spatial dimensions, but anyway, we are a, a brain, a membrane, a B-R-A-N-E, not a B-R-A-I-N, floating around in some bulk, some bigger thing. And there could be other membranes floating around there, and there are indeed ideas where gravity can go from one of these things to another. Um, and maybe we're being pulled from, from outside, in a sense, where outside is kind of a weird term. Um, I, I am no theorist, okay? I, I like to say that I know which end of the telescope to look through, okay? And there are many people here, my colleagues from ECSB, who know much, much more about this than, than I do. But my impression as an impartial and not very knowledgeable observer at some of the 
conference that are held, conferences that are held, is that though that's a possibility that's actively being researched right now, and indeed the possibility of other membranes is, is really being a serious issue right now, but, but even the possibility that maybe they're pulling on us from the outside, even that's being considered, but that that is not a, a very likely solution. And w one reason is that, in, in a sense, it's, you can measure these microwave background fluctuations that we see, and, and it's kind of interesting. We know that they have a, a particular physical size, and that we can calculate in a way that doesn't really depend on the details of the early history of the universe. And so there's, they're like meter sticks. You know how long they are. And you look at how big they appear to be in angular size. And that relationship between how big they appear to be and how big they really are tells you the path, the shape of the path of the light rays. Okay? And it turns out the light rays are going along paths that you learned about in 10th grade geometry, you know, Euclidean straight lines. So that means that the universe on largest scales that we can see is globally flat. And according to the general theory of relativity, that means that there is a certain energy density in the universe. And let's call it 1.0 for kicks. Well, the visible matter and the dark matter are about 0.3, in fact, 0.27. It's the atoms, the 4%, and the wimps, if that's what they are, the 23%. That's 0.27. And if the total is 1, then 1 minus 0.27 by advanced mathematics, last time I checked on my calculator, was 0.73, okay? So they are saying there's got to be another component of energy in the universe if general relativity is correct. And the overall geometry of space is linked with the paths of light through that space. So they're saying, yeah, there's, a, there's an energy there. And moreover, we can tell that that energy is not clumped in clusters of galaxies, but rather has to be sort of more uniformly spread out. And if it's uniformly spread out, however, it can't be light little particles like neutrinos because their presence would have messed up the formation of the largest scale superclusters and voids and stuff in our universe. So it's a, it's a convoluted di uh, argument. But the point is, is that this energy we really think is there and does not have the properties of positively attractive gravity. So we think that there's this energy. But, but that's not to say that general relativity is necessarily correct or that there aren't these other universes pulling out on ours. So you should become a theoretical physicist and study these things in more detail. Other, other questions? Yeah, yes, right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've read about this before, and what concerns me is that you're looking at these supernovae that occurred like 8 billion, 9 billion years ago in the past when the universe was so much younger. Right. Do you, are you ever concerned that maybe the whole nature of a supernova explosion yeah. has changed over time? Sure. Right, so the question is, how do we know that today's supernovae that we've calibrated so well are the same as the ones five to nine billion years ago? After, the, after all, the universe has changed a lot. The white dwarfs themselves may not be made out of the same stuff. There are more heavy elements nowadays than there used to be. That's good for us. We are made of the heavy elements, by the way, that are burst forth into the cosmos, created by these explosions and ejected into the cosmos later on to become stars, planets, and life. This is what Carl Sagan meant when he used to say that we are made of star stuff or stardust. He didn't discover this, but he said it very eloquently. So indeed, the white dwarfs may have been different, and so we might be comparing things that are intrinsically, say, less luminous then than they are now. So there are various ways we can look for differences. Okay? For example, in detail, the spectrum of a distant supernova, if it looks in detail the same as that of a nearby one, then you know, spectroscopy is an extremely powerful pro uh, technique. You can't get similar looking spectra without rather similar physical conditions. Or maybe you can have rather different physical conditions, but there are other ways to test for that. So spectroscopy is very quantitative and very good at telling you about the physics of what's going on. But then you might say, well, maybe we're being fooled anyway. So then I say, okay, you can look at supernovae in different galaxies that are nearby. Some galaxies have a larger proportion of young stars. Some have a larger proportion of old stars. Some have a larger proportion of stars that haven't produced many heavy elements yet. Other galaxies have lots and lots of heavy elements. So the point is, is that nearby type 1a supernovae occur 
in a variety of environments. And some of those environments look much like the early universe, back when, there, when stars were generally younger than they are now. Okay, and, and stars didn't have as many heavy elements as they do now. Well, we can find galaxies where the stars are younger than most of the stars now and where they didn't have as many heavy elements. And so we can locally test by looking at these nearby supernovae how stars probably exploded back when the universe in aggregate form, on average that is, used to be different. Because we can find pockets of it in today's universe the universe on small scales is inhomogeneous, we can find pockets that resemble the early universe. So it's a thing we worry about a lot, and it's exactly these kinds of tests that we're doing. And so far, we have not found any clear differences between the nearby ones and the, and the distant ones. But that's a, it's an extremely po good point that does worry us late at night. Okay, yeah, question over there. Yes, yeah, so a bunch of questions in that part of the room. Yes. Oh, yeah, the question is, will the expansion someday go near or even exceed the speed of light? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you asked that. Um, the expansion, especially in an accelerating universe, can easily exceed, exceed the speed of light. But that is not a violation of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Because the special theory says that nothing can go through, no signal, no signal carrying information can go through a pre-existing space at a speed faster than that of light. But space itself can expand faster than light. So take this rubber band with the ping pong balls on it. Very simply, let's take two ping pong balls that are more than 300,000 kilometers apart from each other. Yeah, 300,000 or 186,000 miles if you per prefer the inferior units. Um, uh, and, and suppose you have these two things, more than 300,000 kilometers apart, and now let's say you double the size of the universe, or let's say you more than double the size of the universe in one second by telling each little bit of rubber to expand by a factor of two or more. You can all agree to do that, okay? You can all come to this agreement. They all do that, so every little bit of space more than doubles, let's say. So now these two ping pong balls are more than twice that original distance apart, that means they've moved more than 300,000 kilometers in one second. Therefore, they have exceeded the speed of light. But can you use that stretching of space to send a signal from one of those galaxies to another? You cannot. And in fact, if you send a signal, be it FedEx or carrier pigeons or even light, in fact, the signal will have a harder and harder time getting to the other um, galaxy if space is accelerating it in its expansion because the amount of remaining space is growing ever faster. So the, the signal will never get from here to there and so it's not a violation of relativity. Cool, huh? Yeah, okay. There were questions uh, right there near the side. Okay, fair enough. What relation did the Big Bang have with the Genesis as described in the Bible? I think that the, as scientists, what we try to do is come up with a better and better working model of how the universe works. How do, how do objects behave within the universe? How do they interact with one another? And so on. Um, and, and the properties of the universe. What is the age of the universe and, and these kinds of things. Um, we don't really ask sort of what the purpose of the universe is or, or you know, why you are here, why, why we are here. Um, and many physicists would even say that we can't even really ask what was around before the beginning because you can't really test that because there's this one universe and how can you test for what was before the beginning. Um, religious beliefs, of course, are, are based on faith and, and tell you sort of how to conduct your life and, and uh, what your morals maybe should be and and what you might turn into after death and things like that. And, and these are beliefs based on faith. And many scientists have many different faiths. And in general, they find no real conflict between their faith-based beliefs and what they're trying to do as scientists, figure out what the laws, quote-unquote, of, of physics are and so on. Um, and they treat 
the scriptures more as a metaphor, perhaps, for how the universe was created, or, or as an allegory, or something like that. Most would not take the Bible literally, in that you know, the universe was created in seven days and all that. Or even if you do, you could say, well, back then, what was a day? Maybe it was a billion years, or something like that. Okay, But most sciences, I would say, even those that are very religious, and there are many, don't take what's called a literal interpretation of the Bible. Now, you could say, well, what if we do take a literal interpretation? Then you would have to say that everything that we measure as scientists is just a figment of our imaginations or has been set up in precisely this way to make it look like the universe is 14 billion years old, to make it look, based on the geologic strata, that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and so on and so forth. It would, it would all have to have been set up. And I cannot believe that a creator would design a universe in precisely such a way as to deliberately fool it, arguably, one of that creator's most magnificent creations, as far as we can tell. Now, there may be other very intelligent creatures out there, and there probably are, but on this earth, we are pretty magnificent. And I just cannot believe that a benevolent creator would have done that. So I reject the hypothesis that this has all been set up. If you accept that it's been all set up, then I could say, well, your whole life was just the last one one-thousandth of a second, and it's, the whole thing is a figment of your imagination. I cannot disprove that, okay? But it could be true. I cannot disprove that all the geologic strata were laid down to fool us, but I just don't think it's true. But I cannot use science to disprove these hypotheses. But nor can I use science to prove them. So I would prefer to keep science and religion completely separate. Each has its own turf. Each asks questions that are best answered within its own domain and address different aspects of human life and, um, and, and belief systems. So I think in general then there's no conflict. If you insist that the whole thing, that everything that scientists measure is wrong, then in fact there is a conflict. But most scientists would say that there is no conflict between religion and science because they don't take things that literally. Okay? That's the best I can do, I would say. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, if, if parts are accelerating faster than the speed of light, is it possible that the dark energy and dark matter reside beyond that boundary? It, it's possible, but that dark energy and dark matter would then not have any influence on space here because receding away from us faster than the speed of light, no signal from that dark matter and dark energy could come over here in such a way as to affect us. Now, it might be beyond the universe, so to speak, as I discussed in answer to one of the other questions, but that's different from being in our universe but beyond what's called our horizon, okay? Uh, yes, in the back there. Is there any relation between the space inside an atom, you're saying, and the dark energy in the universe? Well, possibly. I mean, the, the space inside an atom and everywhere else, in fact, does have these quantum fluctuations going on. Indeed, that very slightly alters the energy levels of the electrons in an atom, and, and that's been measured. Moreover, the space between two highly conducting plates is different from the space outside of them. And you can actually tell, even though there's a vacuum between the plates and a vacuum outside the plates, but those two vacua are different because, remarkably enough, the plates ever so slightly go together, just by a little bit. They just keep on going together because the energy out there is different from the energy inside. But are those the dark energy? We don't know. If the dark energy is quantum fluctuations, then indeed it would be intimately related to the stuff inside of atoms. But although the data right now are most consistent with that hypothesis, that the dark energy has something to do with quantum fluctuations of space itself, of energy in space itself, the, there are a number of theoretical reasons for not liking that hypothesis, and this is what has led to a cottage industry of competing hypotheses. Many of them go by the generic name of quintessence, sort of like the Aristotelian fifth essence, okay? So we don't know. 
basically. Maybe in a few years we'll, we'll have a better idea, uh, we'll have a better answer to your question. Yes? Oh, yeah, so do we think that there are other universes that um, exist or, or, do, or, or could develop? Uh, we have no direct evidence for them, but I personally, speaking, you know, beyond just physics alone, think that they do exist. Sticking just to physics, if you think that inflation is a reasonable theory for our universe, then, in fact, Andre Linde at Stanford and, and other people have shown how you could have this inflating region and in that region, then, the dark energy turns into normal stuff, like you and me. But other little parts of it, due to quantum fluctuations, keep on inflating. And then most of those parts turn into normal stuff. But little parts of that keep on inflating. So you have universes, in a sense, budding off from one another. I mean, they're connected, but they're, for all intents and purposes, they're, they're disconnected, because you can never communicate from one to another. Or if the universe began with quantum fluctuations out of some nothingness, some pre-existing hyperspace, or maybe the universe came into existence with the laws of physics, it could have come into existence many times. So all these things are reasonable deductions based on what we know in quantum physics, okay, and, and assuming this inflation is right. These are, in a sense, reasonable extrapolations based on what we know. But by their very nature, those conclusions, at least temporarily, remove themselves from the realm of physics because we, right now, do not know of any way, even in principle, of testing for these other universes, okay? There may be some ways. Again, you know, feeling gravity from another one might be one way, but you'd have to prove that that's a unique explanation for the phenomenon that you've observed. So the problem is it's hard to test for these other universes, but by their very nature, you know, they remove themselves from the realm of science, but it might still be true that they exist. And if you go a step further, if you'll permit me, there's another reason for thinking that these things um, might exist. And some physicists really detest this kind of reasoning, but I think used not too... If you don't go too far with this kind of reasoning, it has its utility. It's sort of a principle known as the anthropic principle. The idea is the following. Why is our universe so beautifully constructed to allow complexity to develop, culminating, as far as we know right now, on this Earth with humans, okay? Although we will be replaced someday with even more, presumably, evolutionarily advanced beings. If you look at seemingly random, inconsequential constants of nature, uh, like the mass ratio of the proton to the neutron, or the relative strengths of the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force, and, things like that. You find that if you play around with these things and alter their values a little bit, you come up with rather boring universes compared with the one in which we live. For example, universes that only have hydrogen, or only have helium, or only permit iron. Not the rich periodic table that we have, not the rich molecules that we have, but rather uninteresting universes. And so you might say, well, maybe there's only one way to write down a self-consistent set of mathematical laws that govern the behavior of matter and everything else. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's more than one mathematical way of doing it. But suppose there's just one way, but the constants of nature are random accidents in a sense. There's no fundamental reason that the speed of light is what it is. It just happens to be that way. And an analogy is snowflakes. Snowflakes all have a fundamental hexagonal symmetry because of the structure of the water molecule. But no two snowflakes look the same because of detailed, because of differences in the detailed motion of the molecules right at the moment when the snowflake was beginning to form. So no two of them look alike. If the physical constants were laid down by an effectively random process like snowflake formation, and we don't know whether they were laid down this way or not, but I'm speculating, and I, these ideas are not due to me. Other people, much more eminent than I, have been talking about this stuff. So again, it's not just some crazy dude from Berserkly. But anyway, if the constants were dictated by rather random accidents, we call it spontaneous symmetry breaking and things like that, then it could well be that, in fact, um, in other universes, the, the constants had different values. And most of those universes are quite uninteresting compared to ours. We call them stillborn. Some may be equally interesting or even more interesting. 
But ours is one of the relatively rare, interesting ones that allowed complexity to develop, and not surprisingly, we live in such a universe. It's sort of like playing poker. Every hand is equally unlikely, but according to the rules of poker, some hands are better than others. They are winning hands, okay? And so we, by necessity, live in a winning hand because we capitalized on it. There may be many, many more that are not winning hands. And finally, you could say, as an analogy, the ancient Greek philosopher, thousands of years ago, could have contemplated the nature of the earth and asked himself, why does it look so special to allow us to exist? If there is only one, you know, was it created for us? Well, maybe it was. That's not an unreasonable deduction. But with or without a god, the Greek philosopher could have said, maybe bodies like this, for whatever reason, form with a variety of masses and a variety of distances from the stars around which they orbit and a variety of different properties, some of which allow the existence of liquid water and so on, and those, that in which, those in which um, the conditions were conducive to the development of complexity culminating with life, you know, they had a chance to form life, and the other ones had no chance, or less of a chance, or whatever, and we then live in one of those good planets. And so the philosopher could reasonably conclude, but not prove in any observational way, that there is an ensemble of other bodies out there, and that the Earth does not have special properties necessarily by design, but rather has special properties by accident, and we necessarily developed in one of the worlds with special properties. I'm sorry for the lengthy answer, but that was such an interesting question that I wanted to do it. Yes? Oh, yeah. So how do the extra dimensions of string theory fit into the idea of dark energy? Well, there's a number of ways. The most fundamental, I think, is that to work these string theories, theories that say that at the fundamental level, all of the elementary particles are little packages of energy in the shape of a string or a membrane sort of flopping around, vibrating. And to get the mathematics to work out, to resemble anything close to our universe, you have to have the vibrations occur in multiple dimensions, more than just the three that we see. There are like seven or six, depending on your version of string theory, of additional dimensions, most or all of which are cool, curled up into tiny, tiny scales that we cannot see. So this sounds pretty crazy, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily crazy. Imagine you're a bird flying over a sheet of sandpaper. From far above, you see what looks like a two-dimensional flat sheet. But if you swoop down and look at it under a magnifying glass, you see that it has granularity. It has a third dimension. And that's a richer universe. Or a hose seen from far away. Ants going along that hose, if it were truly one-dimensional, would just sort of smack into each other, and then they'd have to turn around, kind of a boring existence. But if that hose actually has a small circular dimension, then two ants coming next to each other could say, oh, I'll just bypass this one and keep on going. And the ants themselves might have two-dimensional bodies and so on. So you have a richer universe that way, even though on the largest scales you don't notice those tiny dimensions, but re they're really there. So that's the premise of string theory. Okay, that's one of the premises. So, how this could affect things is that if string theory ends up being the theory that unifies quantum physics and general relativity, then, as I said, we think that this unification will lead to an explanation of the dark energy, or conversely, the properties of the dark energy will help in this unification process. And so they will be then intimately related. The dark energy will be perhaps the most obvious physical manifestation in today's low energy old universe of string theory. Yeah, there was a question right there, yes. Yeah, globular clusters, mm -hmm. yeah. Thirteen point seven. Yeah, so the question is, you know, there are these beautiful clusters of stars called globular clusters. Yeah, and they're, th they're up to 13 billion years old. And we now think the universe is pretty close to 13.7 plus or minus 0.2 billion years old. So that's 
older than the globular clusters. It didn't used to be that way. A, a decade ago, uh, there was still a problem, a little bit more than a decade ago, that the best derived ages for the globular clusters were bigger than the derived expansion age of the universe. So how can some of the contents of the universe be older than the universe itself? That's like saying that you're older than your mother. Okay, it's sort of a physical impossibility unless you're Dr. Spock or something like that, you know. So um, two things happened. The ages of the globular clusters that were calculated back then had been too high. They were thought to be 16 billion years old or something, and they're more like 13 or 12. And moreover, we now have a pretty accurate current expansion rate of the universe. That's the so-called Hubble constant. And we have, at least to a first order approximation, the expansion history. It decelerated for the first 9 billion years and then accelerated for the next 5 billion or so. So you take today's expansion rate coupled with the expansion history and you calculate that the age is 13.7 billion years old and the globular cluster ages have gone down to 12 or 13. So suddenly there's this comfort zone. And if you take spectra of the stars of globular clusters, you find that indeed they have a very small proportion, much smaller than that of the sun, of heavy elements. That's because these were among the first generations of stars to form. Not the very first generation, because these things are not completely devoid of carbon and oxygen and iron and the things we love, because we're made out of them. But the abundances are very low. So what we think happened is that the first generation of stars formed two to three hundred million years after the Big Bang. That polluted space with heavy elements, from which then new stars formed with a slight but non-zero abundance of these heavy elements. And the kinds of supernovae that we think polluted space with these heavy elements may have been the super-duper supernova that I showed you near the beginning of my talk, this one that exploded by a new kind of a mechanism. And that's important if it's true, because it means that the first generation of stars, which theorists think were more massive on average than today's stars, did not all go wonk and collapsed to form black holes, some of them successfully exploded, ejecting newly synthesized heavy elements into the cosmos, making it possible eventually for the Earth and life and us to arise. And if that isn't one of the most cosmically magnificent stories, the, sto the story of our creation and emergence from the hydrogen and helium of the Big Bang, then, then I don't know what a better story would be, you know. So. One more question. Okay, how about over here? Yes. Ah, that, that's an interesting question. The, I said that clusters of galaxies are dense enough to be gravitationally bound. But eventually, on the largest scales, you get to regions where the anti-gravity, if you will, dominates. And what can that teach us um, about the future um, and also about the dark energy itself? First, this is one of the things that independently suggests the existence of dark energy, by the way. And it's a very clever argument. Beyond the clusters of galaxies, there are the so-called superclusters. They're very large. They can be 100 million light years in diameter. They're, they're sufficiently weakly bound that, in fact, the dark energy is spreading them apart, it turns out, even though the dark energy is not spreading clusters of galaxies apart. Now, it turns out that if there were no dark energy, then photons or particles of light from the afterglow of the Big Bang, the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation, entering one of these superclusters would gain some energy on its way in because it's going into an attractive region of space. Uh, okay, it's going into a supercluster of galaxies, and so it gains some energy. It's called a gravitational blue shift. But then on the way out, it would lose an equal amount of energy as a gravitational red shift, leading to no net gain or loss of energy for those photons. And so in the direction of the superclusters of galaxies, you should see no variation in the microwave background caused by that intervening cluster. But if the cluster is expanding faster than it should have because it's been acted upon by dark energy, 
Then during the time of flight of that photon, the cluster expands, its gravity weakens, its so-called gravitational potential weakens, if you want to get more technical, and the gain of energy of the photon on the way in is greater than the loss of energy of the photon on the way out, and so there's a net gain in energy, and that region of space, 13.7 billion light years away, looks a little bit hotter than the surrounding regions, okay? This is called technically the integrated sachs wolf effect, and it has been noticed at a marginally statistically significant level. I think it's real, okay? But it's, it's a little bit dicey still, but I think it's real. Uh, and that's an independent confirmation that on the scale of the superclusters of galaxies, in fact, there is this dark energy that's acting upon them. What that tells us about the future, um, I would say so far not much. You know, that, those measurements alone don't tell us much. But in conjunction with the other measurements, we are getting more and more independent ways of measuring distances in the universe as a function of redshift, volumes, and the growth of large-scale structure. And all those things together are determined by the detailed properties of the dark energy. Exactly how has it changed with time? It looks to a first approximation as though the dark energy is a property of space that does not depend on time. So unlike normal matter, where you have a thousand particles in the box, if you expand that box, the density goes as one over the volume, right? Double the volume, the density is one half as big. Well, this stuff, double the volume, and the density remains the same. Yeah. Now, maybe that's not true. You know, maybe it deviates a little bit from that, but so far, the observations seem to be indicating that. And I can see the gears turning in many of your heads. I just said that you double the volume, and the density of the stuff remains the same, but that means there's twice as much stuff. That's crazy, right? You're creating stuff out of nothing. Here's the rub, okay? This is a positive energy, so it contributes to the total positive energy of the universe. Indeed, it helps make the universe spatially flat on large scales. Otherwise, it would be negatively curved. It would be kind of like a horse's saddle. But this stuff kind of flattens it out. So it's a positive energy. And so there is a gravitational attraction of all the stuff for all the other stuff. It's a gravitational attraction, and it's non-zero. In fact, it's quite big. It's just that the pressure of this stuff is an even bigger quantity and it dominates over the gravitational attraction. So overall, the universe accelerates with time. But the gravitational attraction cannot be ignored. And it turns out that the magnitude, the size of the gravitational attraction, is exactly equal to, but, but negative, of the amount of matter that you have in this dark energy. So as the amount of dark energy grows, the amount of gravitational attraction, which can be thought of as a negative energy, grows negative at the same rate, and the two end up being zero. The energy of the universe appears to be exactly or very close to zero. And with a dark energy-dominated universe, that's a very natural result. You're not creating something out of nothing. It's like an apple. Its kinetic or energy of motion is zero, at least in my frame of reference here. I can define its gravitational energy, its potential energy, to be zero. So here it is, zero plus zero is zero. As I drop the apple, it clearly picks up energy of motion, one, two, three, four, five units of kinetic energy, but it's also picking up negative one, two, three, four, five units of potential energy, gravitational energy, which exactly balances the kinetic energy. So I've not created nor have I destroyed energy in this process, and I won't become rich and famous because I solve the energy energy problems of the world, okay? All I've done is I've dropped an apple, okay? So in a similar way, the growth of the universe from dark energy conserves energy. It's zero, and the universe could have just started as some little quantum fluctuation, so it's almost identically zero. And as Alan Guth, one of the originators of the inflation theory, likes to say, the universe may be the ultimate free lunch. Its total energy is zero, it, it came out of nothing, but fortunately for us, there's a positive component to the energy, you and I and everyone else, 
Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, the Cavalry Institute, LCOGT. But there's also a negative energy. Our attraction for everything else in the universe exactly balances the matter that you have. Talking about, you know, not leaving a footprint, well, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll be happy to hang around a bit longer. Thank you. Thank you very much.